Hello, CWC family. We are excited about today's service. As it begins to fill up, we ask you to do a few things. If you would, please scoot in to allow available seats on the outside of the rows. You may also see ushers come down asking how many seats are available. If you will help us out with that, we're going to be starting service in just a few minutes. Center family. We are excited about our services today. We've been praying and we are anticipating for God to move. We want to welcome all you guys this morning. If you've been here more than once, we welcome you back. Thank you for being here. You are a part of our family. But maybe this is your first time here. We want to welcome you big. We want to make sure that you feel welcome. And the most important thing, we hope that you feel the presence of the Lord. But here, before we start, is a few things that you need to know. If you've been thinking and praying about joining our church, we have our class coming up April the 28th. You can go online and sign up right now under the events tab. We pray as a church that you are ready to join with us because we are ready to join with you. On Saturday, May the 11th is our annual CWC Youth Car Show. We are getting excited about this day. Now listen, there's going to be some awesome items that you can get your hands on for that day. If you want more information about that, all you have to do after the service, there will be some people out there in the foyer to give you all the info you need to know. Don't miss out. Also on Saturday, May the 11th, which is our car show, we are also hosting a Boston Butt fundraiser as well. You can get those tickets online under the events tab. Don't miss out. They taste great. This announcement is one of my favorites because I love community. I love when we build and grow together. We have an awesome opportunity coming up, but it's a year away, but we want to get you guys signed up. It is our spring break trip for 2025. If you need more details on that, you can contact Wendy Robinson or myself, Ryan Elrod. Don't miss out on this awesome trip. And now it is time for church to begin. I truly believe, as I've been praying this week, that God wants to move. So listen to this. In Psalms 121, it says, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? And I love what he says. My help comes from the Lord. So as we begin our service today, worship, believe, knowing that God is a good God and he is able to to do more than you could ever imagine. So as we go into this service today, remember one thing, he is your help. Let's have church.
today And we won't be quiet We shout out of your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely here in this place And we won't be quiet
Uh, today is a very special day as uh, several times throughout the year uh, we do child dedications and that is what we want to do in this moment during this time. Now there may be some of you that uh, you've come in here today and you're like, you know, why do you do child dedications? Well, because it's scriptural. Uh, it's very important that we do so. Uh, in fact, we can find the story of when Jesus, when he was dedicated, that Mary and Joseph took uh, baby Jesus to the temple to dedicate him and they were following scripture which is in Luke chapter 2 verse 23 it says added as it is written in the law of the Lord every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and so we know that this was a very special moment for Jesus as we know that they had this interaction with a guy by the name of Simeon who it was his prayer that God would give him the opportunity to see the Messiah firsthand. And Simeon praised the Lord for that. They had an interaction with a prophetess by the name of Anna and that she also glorified the Lord, you know, about the opportunity to be able to bless and to pray over this precious child. Uh, but today we've got two families who that they uh, also have sons and they would like for you as their church family to play a role in a part of this child dedication. So at this time, if I could have Kyle and Melissa Smith, if you guys would please come and bring Breckham. Then we want Pastor John and Kelsey Luna to bring Lincoln Graham, if you guys would come up also as well. And so we truly were honored to, you know, be, be asked to be a part of a service like this and to understand that you and I as a church family, we have a role and an obligation to help these families, to do everything that we can to raise these children in the admonitions of Christ, raise them up so that they can be prepared to be used by God for His glory and for His honor. And so we take our children and our youth ministries very serious here at the Cleveland Worship Center. And so this is just a first step for us. And there's going to be so many stories and so many things that's going to come forth because of this relationship that we have with these families that are part of our church. And as I often say is that God has called us corporately together to celebrate with each other during the good times, but also to be with each other during those hard and difficult times because we know that it's part of life that there's, there's ebbs and flows that we often have. And so today we want to focus on these children specifically. And I want you to see in advance. I want you to envision with me. I want you to capture something that's gonna happen in the future that I'm speaking over both of these young men that we could be praying over today, the next pastor of this church. We could be praying over the next president of the United States. We could be praying over the next businessman that's going to lead this community back to you know, the solid belief of what it means, a foundation of a community built upon faith in Jesus Christ. I want you to see what God can do in advance. And I believe great things are in store for each and every one of them. And it is my hope and my prayer that you're going to make a connection with these families uh, here today and that you're going to take some ownership in this. And you're going to understand that they're asking for your help in this process as well. And so we're going to pray over them and pray a blessing upon the families, specifically over these children, because these families are more, they're dedicating themselves. You see, there will be a point when these boys, when they grow up, that they're going to have the choice and the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. These families are coming before you today saying that they've already made that decision. And so they are more dedicating themselves before the Lord than they are necessarily for the children because the children are going to make this decision later on. But I want us to stand beside these families and agree with these families and let's pray for them, you know, that God's going to do great and mighty things through them. So I want to ask for you to participate with me this morning. If you would stretch your hands this way and let's, let's pray for the Smith family and let's pray for Breckham. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just come before you. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, for this family to be a part of this church. And God, to be able to stand before them and with them today, I'm honored. And I know that this church family is honored. But God, I believe that you're calling this family to a higher standard. And within that standard, they are committing that this husband and wife team, that they're going to raise Breckham, Lord, in, within the admonitions of Christ. And they're going to do everything they can, Lord, to point this, this, this precious young man to you. God, I pray over their home. I pray over everything in every area of their life. God, I pray blessings upon them mentally, socially, emotionally, financial blessings upon them, but above all, spiritually. 
Lord, spiritual blessings that they would lead by example because this young man is going to see every move and he's going to hear every word. He's going to see everything that these parents do and he's going to emulate them. He's going to follow them. So God, I pray as they make that commitment today to dedicate themselves before you, God, that you're going to use them in great ways. But Lord, I pray for Breckham today. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would bless him. God, I pray that you would just minister to him. Lord, even as Jesus, as he left the, the, uh, the temple that day, that the Bible says that he continued to grow in wisdom and stature. And God, that you would do great things, Lord, through Breckham. God, I praise you, Lord, for him. He is such a blessing. And Lord, he's a blessing to us. God, I pray that we as a church family, that these children would be on our hearts and on our minds always. And God, that we would continue to lift and support them, Lord, in every time, in every moment of their life. I give you praise, Lord, for the Smith family. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, we pray for the Lunas today. God, I just I thank you, Lord, for this family. God, I thank you, Lord, what they mean, Lord, to this church and this ministry. But God, I pray, Lord, as, as John and Kelsey are saying, that they want to do everything they can to raise Lincoln, Lord, in a way that's going to point him to you, Jesus. God, I pray you would continue to bless their home. God, I pray that, they, that God, that you would you would use Leland to be an example to this brother and that he would that he would be a brother that would protect him that would lead him Lord that he would love him and, mm -hmm. and so we just ask God that you just continue to do great things Lord through this family God we specifically pray for Lincoln today God I pray Lord in advance Lord as we go forth Lord in, in this life God I pray great things for him God, that I know that you're developing within him, within him and his mind and his knowledge. God, I pray that you would just continue to, to order his steps. And God, I pray for that day that he accepts you as his Lord and Savior. God, that that will be the key. And Lord, it will unlock all great things ahead of him. God, I pray that he's go, as he goes forth, God, that he will give you all glory and all praise and all honor. God, I pray for both of these young men. I pray, Lord, for their future spouses, that you're preparing in advance for them, that you're going to join them together, and they're going to be a powerhouse couple that's going to change this world for kingdom work. And we give you praise. I give you honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen, amen. Okay, guys, the greatest tool that we can present to you guys is a Bible. So we would like to present you guys their very first Precious Moment Bible. And we pray that you guys would use this and read this to them every single night. This is the weapon. This is the sword that they're going to need to fight this battle that, they are gonna, that they're going to engage in within this life. We thank you guys so much, and we're honored to be a part of this service today. Thank you so much. You guys may be seated. Can we give them a hand clap? We got one more song we're going to sing for you this morning. Just going into it. Just thinking about mercy. It's talking about mercy. Where would we be if it wasn't for the Lord? If you look back through your life, years gone by, all the choices made that, that you made somehow got you to this place. But how many know that the mercy of God was there? We're not perfect in no way. But God brings his mercy and he shows forgiveness and he lights the way and the path that we go. This morning, listen to the words of this song as we sing it. Just let it reach into your heart this morning. Well, I'm living proof of what the mercy of God can do If you knew me then you believe me now You turned my whole life upside down You took the old and you made it new That's what the mercy of God can do I'm alive to tell the story of how I've overcome this is goodness and mercy and the power of his blood well I'm so glad that my freedom wasn't based on what I've done but the goodness and mercy in the power of His blood
What an amazing set of, of uh, songs that we sang here this morning. Uh, it, again, it is an honor to have you here and a part of the Cleveland Worship Center family. I didn't mean to leave out, but I uh, do want to honor the Luna family and, and the Stamies and the Johnsons. I know that the Smith family had family members as well that were here and a part of this service as well. Uh, it takes a village to raise children. Amen. So it takes all of us, and so we are. We're, we're just we're thankful that you are here today. Um, we want to welcome everybody watching our service live stream as well. As we always say that that God is growing our footprint as a church, so we're reaching all across the world. And I just want to make an invitation for those who are watching our services live stream. If you have a prayer request or need, please direct message us. Let us know, and our team will be glad and honored to pray with you about whatever situation that you may be facing. Um, if you are new with us, I want to invite you to please go on our website, log on to the Guest Connect tab, fill that information out. It comes back to me, lets me know a little bit better how we as a church can serve you and your family 
better, uh, but it also, it's a way of signing up for our Monday at 12 o'clock noon. Alyssa sends out an updated events page of everything that's going on. We've got so much ministry and so many things going on at the CWC. There's no way we've got time during one service to be able to share all of it. Um, as you came in this morning, I'm pretty sure you probably noticed that we are gearing up for our youth uh, car show, which is going to be Saturday, May the 11th. Uh, this is always a big event for us. Starts at 9 o'clock. And we've had several businesses within our community who they believe in our youth ministry. And they've made some donations that we have put out into the foyer. And as you leave today, check one of those out. Maybe there's something you're in, interested in. And uh, grab a ticket uh, as you'll be entered into uh, a chance to maybe win some of those items. Also, on this same day, our children will, uh, will be having a Boston Butt uh, fundraiser sale. And guys, listen to me. Mother's Day is the following day on Sunday. So just this is a little, I'm giving you some help here. You can plan lunch by coming to the car show and getting a Boston butt and having it for Mother's Day. So see, I just made your life very easy. You guys can thank me later. Um, if you want to buy a Boston butt in my name and give it to me, um, I will receive that as well as uh, appreciation for such a very wise suggestion that I just made to you. Thank you, Pastor Andy. Thank you, worship team, uh, for leading us this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me this morning to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And I want to do something, and we don't do this very often. We probably don't do this enough. And I know that we just sat down. But I want to ask, would you stand with me in honor as we read God's Word, as we prepare ourselves for a very, very difficult topic here today? Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 and 16, the writer says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now let's break this down a little bit. There's a lot of information that's right here within these two verses. It says, that, let, let us read this again. For we do not have a high priest. Who is the high priest the writer is talking about? Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. He is our high priest who cannot sympathize. Now this word sympathize in Greek, it was translated, can be translated deeper to mean to be touched with a feeling of compassion and empathy based on experience. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but in all points tempted. The Amplified Bible translates this deeper and says that Jesus knows exactly how it feels to be human and the pain that is often associated with it, yet he did it without any sin. Now, this is what I know, church. Today, it's going to take a lot of boldness out of each and every one of us, including myself, to work through this topic today. If we want to experience the grace of and the mercy and the freedom that I know that God has for us. We're going to have to get serious here today. So I want to ask if you place your hand upon your heart and would you pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we, as we dive into this word today, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just move across this campus and move across this service. And God, that you would move, Lord, even those who were in at home or wherever they're traveling from. God, I pray that you would minister to us in a supernatural way to each and every one. God, that there's a lot of things going on. People are going through a lot of stuff. But God, what I know is that we have a tendency to push back. We Sometimes that we, we we, we, we get locked into where we are and we get accustomed to it. We become satisfied to it. But God, I pray that we would break, the, break that in Jesus' name so that we would receive everything that you would have for us. And God, I pray that you would begin your healing work right now. And I give you praise in advance for what you're going to do in this service today. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Today I want to go against the grain and I want to talk about a subject that is very, very heavy. And let me preface this by saying that the topic that we're going to dive into, this is going to make some of you very uncomfortable. But, the pro but this problem, it often, it goes, it goes unreported, it often goes unrecognized, yet it impacts more people and more families than what you can even think or even imagine. Today I want to talk about the hidden scars that many of us that we hide from, that we try to hide beneath us because of something that we may have gone through somewhere within our past. I want to talk about our hidden scars. Now, according to the South Anoda Child Advocacy Center, which is a nonprofit agency that represents children 
and families victims of abuse that they actually operate here in White County and Lumpkin County in the North Georgia area. They have a statistic that they said that, that one in 10 children will be sexually abused before the age of 18. I want you to let that sink in. Think about that from a statistical perspective. One out of 10 children will be sexually abused before they reach the age of 18. According to the CDC, at least one in seven children have experienced some other form of abuse or neglect. That 61 million women and 53 million men across this nation have experienced some form of psychological aggression in their lifetime. Now, I've got to be honest that as I, I've been working on this particular message for a couple of weeks and I got lost within the statistics. In fact, this past Monday, I was digging in deep, trying to working on and trying to develop, you know, how, where to go within this, this sermon here today. And I want you to know that I, I, I physically, I got sick. I got nauseous as I was going through these numbers and to consider how many people are walking around within our community that they are hiding scars based upon some type of abuse within their life. Now, let me say on the front end of this or preface this whole sermon with this, the obvious thing is this, there is no way that I've got time today just within this short little period that I have to go in detail of every single area to, to uncover or to you know, break apart every angle with this subject in this short little, little bit of time that I have. But I, along our prayer team, our altar team, we've been praying all week long for you that enough is going to be said that will encourage you to lean into Jesus to where you can receive healing today. That is our prayer for you today, that whatever it is, whatever that heaviness, whatever that thing that you have been hiding for a long time, we're going to pray that God's going to make this happen, that God's going to perform a miracle within you. Now, you may ask, okay, Pastor Mark, how is this possible? Is this even possible? And the answer is yes. The reason this is possible is because of Jesus and what Jesus did upon a cross nearly 2,000 years ago. That is why we come here today, and that is why we're going to dive into this very difficult subject today, because in Jesus, there is healing, and then we can receive that in him. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now, in Matthew chapter 27, and if you have your Bible and you want to turn there with me, there are six verses of Scripture that, that kind of capture the horror, uh, the torture, the psychological abuse, the emotional abuse, everything that Jesus endured. Six verses of scripture that kind of, we capture a glimpse of really how much abuse and how much sacrifice of everything that Jesus went through. Now, I want to start by reading the first verse here. Matthew 27 and verse 26 says that when he, who is the he, this is talking about the governor, Pontius Pilate, when he had scourged or flogged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, there are many scholars and theologians believe that Jesus, from the point, if you were here last week, we talked about when Jesus was arrested, at the, at when they were coming out of the Garden of Gethsemane, from that moment to his death, many believe that Jesus was stripped naked and clothed four different times in that process. Now, you may say, why would they do this? Why would they strip someone naked? Well, one, two reasons. The one is that they want to increase physical pain. Because you can imagine if you have clothes on, you know, if somebody's beating you, that, that your clothes can actually somewhat protect you. And so they strip the clothes off of you. The second reason is to increase emotional shame. You see, there are many that believe that these guards, that when they were abusing Jesus, they actually sexually abused him as well. Because, I mean, they, they were just, they were flat, they were evil. And so the weapon of choice that they used to, to whip Jesus was a leather strap that inside the leather they had broken bone and glass and metal within it and a guard would start on one side of the body and they would whip one side of a person's back. Now, the Jews had a law that they could only be whipped 39 times. But the Romans, they didn't have no law. So there was no limit to what a Roman guard, what they were allowed to do, especially to a Jew. And so they would whip and they would beat, you know, the side until it literally was ripped open. And then they would turn and start on the other side. And they would whip and they would beat. And if that guard, if that Roman soldier, if he got tired, another soldier would take his place because they wanted every lick. They wanted every whip. They wanted it to hurt. Now, by this point within the story, we know that a victim that they would probably vomit, they would have uncontrolled tremors, that they would probably pass out, that there were many that they would even die in this first process 
of the crucifixion. They wouldn't make it any further than this. But according to the scripture that we just read, we know that Pilate, that he sent Jesus forward, that they flogged him and they sent him forward to be crucified. But let's pick up the next verse, verse 27. It says, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, which is like a governor's headquarters here, and they gathered a whole garrison with him. Now, most scholars believe that a garrison would range between 150 soldiers, if not more. Now, can you imagine innocent Jesus, you know, mild, meek Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, taking the sin of the way of the world, that it took 150 soldiers to take care of this? I mean, this is just, this is the type uh, of, of pain that they wanted to inflict upon him. Verse 28 says, and they stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it, it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed a knee before him and mocked him saying, hail king of the Jews. And they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him, put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Now, I don't want to take too much time in talking about the, the crucifixion and how hard that it is because I think it's kind of painted in front of you. But if you want to describe what crucifixion is, there is a word that has been created by someone who saw crucifixion. There was a word that has been coined to define crucifixion and that is the word excruciating. Cr excruciating kind of pain. And so when they flogged him, this was just a warm up about what Jesus was going to really endure. Now, at this point that they probably likely, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm short, shorting the whole story that Jesus had to carry a cross member to a cross and he, they carried him to Golgotha, you know, the place of the skull. And there they would have drove stakes through his wrist into the cross beam. They would have hoisted him up and they would have drove nails through his ankles and through his feet, you know, in this moment. They would have ripped his clothes back off again to increase more shame. Now, by this point, somebody, they would go mad. Most people would go mad within their mind. And they would beg for just someone, just go ahead and kill them. Now, the reason I'm going in so much detail with this is that I want you to know, and th th this whole sermon is built upon this statement. Jesus knows suffering. Jesus knows what suffering is like. But I also want you to know that he has the compassion and empathy on any of you that you have suffered in some form of abuse somewhere within your life. And so sadly put, in, in many churches, in many faith circles, in many faith communities, many people feel ashamed. They are afraid to even talk about the abuse. And by default, they often they try to hide their scars because they believe, well, if I don't talk about it, then maybe it'll just go away. Maybe it'll just magically disappear. And I understand the reasoning and why we as people, why we do this, because we often, we refuse. We don't want to believe what has happened to us. That, that was that a dream? That, that, did that really happen to me? And yet at other times, we try to minimize the situation and we try to kind of think, well, that other person, that maybe they're not as bad as we thought they were or we'll even buy into the lie that somehow that we deserve it. Somehow that somehow we did something that we deserve the pain and the punishment. But the problem that I see is that for many of us that we always or we usually just associate when we talk about abuse, we always just talk about it being a physical issue. But there are multiple other things. In fact, there are four major major abuses that are out there. And there are many, many more, but I'm kind of giving you my top four. And that would be physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and then scriptural abuse. So let me kind of break this down. All of these are very important. Physical abuse is pretty obvious. Uh, this could be hitting or pushing, choking, biting, or kicking. Sexual abuse is any unwanted sexual behavior that wasn't consented, that you didn't say that it was okay. This could be defined as rape or inappropriate touching or inappropriate sexual comments. But then there's emotional abuse. And statistics say that this is where our culture struggles the most, that there's more emotional abuse more than anything else than, than all these that we're going to talk about today. And this could be defined as verbal abuse, name-calling, trying to control another person, 
This could be constant criticizing or isolating, shaming, gaslighting, blaming, threatening to leave, divorce, suicide, and some other form of self-harm. Notice all these are emotional abuses. But then the last one that I quickly want to hit on is I want to talk about scriptural or spiritual abuse. And this is when someone weaponizes their faith. They weaponize things like the Bible. They, they misinterpret it. They use it for their gain, that they kind of apply it as authority. They misuse the control, and they manipulate someone to do something that is unethical or even wrong. Now, listen, as much as we would like to think that this doesn't happen, the unfortunate thing, it happens every single day. And you're going to hear me say this a lot. Don't ever check your brain out of the door just because it's a church. Can somebody, can I, can I get real here today? Don't do that. And you, you may wonder, why do we go to so much lengths and so much effort in our kids and our youth ministries? You see, anyone who serves or volunteers, teaches, or you're a part of our kids' ministry or youth ministry, you are required to go through an extensive background check, and you have to be a mandate reporter. And so sometimes we have parents like, you know, why, why, why can I not be in a certain room? Why can I not, you know, just come flying in in a youth service? Because, listen, the protection of our kids is number one here. We have a responsibility here. There are some bad people that are out there, and we've got to be very cautious and very careful. Don't check your brain out of the door just because it's a church. Don't you hear my heart here? But that raises the question here today. How do we as the church, how do Christians, how do we respond to abuse? Or more importantly, how do we help those pick up the pieces and experience the healing that they've been trying to hide, things that they've been trying to cover up for, if not years, for decades within their life? Now, let me insert this by saying that this process that I'm talking about today is not easy. It's not a very simple process. But the good news is that with the presence of God, with godly counsel, and then in a safe community, healing is possible. Healing is possible. Now, I need you to help me preach this sermon. Would you turn to your neighbor and tell him to say, healing is possible? Healing is possible. Now, I want to start off right here, and I want to address two, two groups of people today. And I want to start off by addressing those who are abusing. That I want to speak directly to those of you who are misusing your power to hurt someone else. Now, I've got to be completely honest here. That when I'm thinking about this subject, when I'm thinking about, you know, what's going on and what people are going through, my flesh wants to rise up. And I want to fight fire with fire. i am just got to, be, got to be real. You see, my flesh says that if I knew that you was abuser, meet me out behind the church after the service and we'll take care of it. Try that in a small town. That's not, that was... I'm sorry that that was not supposed to, supposed to be a very serious moment. God's calling me to a higher standard. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to honor God in how I'm going to approach this subject. Because this is what I know is that those of you who maybe you are the abuser, statistics show that probably you were abused or somebody hurt you sometime in your life. And so today I'm going to come to you. I'm going to come towards you with as much compassion as I possibly can because what we know is that hurt people hurt people. Those who are hurt often turn it around and they continue with the hurt and they pass that along. You see, what you may need more than anything today is you need help to deal with your hidden pain, the things that you have been trying to cover up. You need healing and you need to stop putting others through things that they don't deserve. And I say this as loving as, as, as I possibly can. It is never okay to abuse. It is not okay. So stop using the excuses. Stop trying to justify, you know, your actions of how you are treating somebody. You need to own it. And you need to repent of your sin before the Lord. That's what you need to do. And today I want you to know that you're in a safe place. That forgiveness is possible for you. And that healing can start in you today. Now also, I, I, I got to be a little bit more sharp here and tell you that the abuse that you are giving towards somebody else, it doesn't make you strong. It actually makes you weak, very weak. And that's not entirely a bad thing because the reality is, is every single one of us, we are weak. You see, I'm weak. And what that means is I'm imperfect. That means that I am broken. 
And so every single one of, you know, everybody who is here today is in the same boat. But it is in my weakness that Scripture says that my, as long as my faith is in Jesus, my faith in Jesus is what, is what makes us stronger. It's found in Corinthians that our faith in him is what changes things. And so in, today, instead of shaming you away from Jesus, I want to love you today towards Jesus because he is the only one who can bring the healing that you so desperately need. Second group of people that I want to talk to today is I want to talk to those of you who you are on the receiving end of this, that you maybe are currently suffering some form of abuse. And I want to encourage you first and foremost is get to a safe place. Get to a safe place. Remove yourself from harm's way. And when you find that safe place, give it some time. Once your life starts to stabilize, that is when you can start moving towards the healing process. That is when you can start receiving the love and healing and counseling that people can help you and walk with you and you can start walking and receiving the redemptive power of who Jesus is. You know, just let Jesus do what only Jesus can do within us. And listen, you will never experience healing as long as you harbor anger and bitterness. This is a very important point. You cannot heal and hate at the same time. But when the time is right, that is when you can forgive that other person who has harmed you. You see, even Jesus, when we talk about the suffering, the horrific detail of what this looked like, what Jesus went through, Jesus uttered the most powerful and loving words. And I've quoted this same scripture for the last three weeks. So I think that if we're going to quote it through, it must be very important. There must be something that we're needing to learn from. Luke chapter 23, verse 34, when he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And I know some of you are going to give me some pushback and you may say, you know, it is never easy to forgive someone who has hurt you. And I will 100% agree with you on that, especially when you are the victim. But what I want you to know is that forgiveness is not about letting that offender off the hook. It's not saying that they shouldn't face the consequences for whatever they have done. No, what forgiveness is, is that it releases the offender to God. In other words, you are trusting that person to God and you're trusting God to do what is right. It's letting go of your need and desire to control the situation and trusting God with them. And again, everything that I'm talking about today, none of this is easy. But what I've discovered is that when you pray for someone else, that prayer may not necessarily change them, but that prayer is going to change you. Prayer always changes you. It always changes the situation. And I know what some of you are thinking. How do you forgive someone of something that they have done that would be tagged what you would define as the unforgivable. I mean, how do we even get past that when, when something that they've done is so unforgivable? And the greatest advice that I can give you is that you forgive just like God has forgiven you. Your faith in Christ that you are forgiven. Now, this is gonna be a little bit hard for some of you to hear, but every person on this planet has sinned. Every single one. So what does that mean? If you're on the planet, that means every person here today, under the sound of my voice, you're a sinner. Welcome to the Cleveland Worship Center where we're here to make you feel good about yourself. You know, we're all there. We're all, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. And so what I know for me is that, you know, every single day that I don't always respond in a godly way. I may not always say everything that's going to be honoring God. I may do something that is not honoring to God. And so it is every day that I'm dependent upon God's grace and mercy because I seem to always fall a little bit short. And that's why I often that I say that I can relate to Peter so much because it's just sometimes I just can't seem to get it right. But I believe that is why Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, he says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So church, we've got to learn to forgive. And listen, that forgiveness, it may not necessarily change that person, but forgiveness always changes you. Your prayer changes you and forgiveness changes you. Now, does this mean that you just go back to normal? Go back to doing what you once did, heaven forbid. No. No, in fact, I hope that, that, that the goal is, is that things are going to get better, better for each of us. Because what does forgiveness do? It forgives us of any pain. It frees us from any pain and anger, the bitterness, the hatred that you may have towards someone else. Something that you have bottled up for years within you. And I know how it goes. 
It's that you, you may have a good season in life and everything is great and you're just fine. But then suddenly you find, put some tension within your life, face some hardships within your life. There are many of you that you are like a pressure cooker that any second from now you're about to explode because you've been bottling it up. You've never dealt with the root issue or the root problem. Now, am I saying that you subject yourself back to the place of pain? Do you subject yourself back to the place of abuse? And there's a lot of great studies out there about this topic. Uh, but there is an author by the name of Lisa Turkhurst. And I know that some of our ladies have done some, bio, some discipleship studies using some of her material. But she is like a, 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 she's got the experience within this. And so she talks a lot about establishing boundaries between you and that person who has hurt you. You see, the proverb says that a city without a wall is vulnerable. A city without any protection, it is vulnerable. And so you can forgive someone, but yet at the same time create some safe and right, healthy and appropriate honoring boundaries with another person. And you may say, why? Why is this important? Because the previous behavior, their previous behavior cannot be tolerated. It is not acceptable anymore. Now, listen, again, this is the kind of topic, I've got to be completely honest. This is not what I wanted to talk about today. This is one that I pushed back and I said, God, there's no way that I want to bring this subject up. But God continued to, to lay this upon me. And, and this has been heavy. This has been so heavy. And, and again, I resisted it, but I know that this is where we are because I know if statistics hold what is true, what, what I have read about, then this is a major issue even for many of us, many even within our church family and those who are gonna watch this service, even live stream, this is a big deal. But I also know, again, there's no way that I'm gonna have time to really break this down and go in every single detail of everything of what is going on when it comes to abuse. But what my job is today is to point you to the one who can. Jesus does. Jesus understands. And so we read Hebrews chapter 4. We read verses 14 and 15. We read those verses and we believe by faith that, that, that Jesus, he understands. He sympathizes. He has empathy and compassion because he suffered more than what you and I can even think or imagine. And because he suffered, we can achieve victory. We can walk in within victory today. Why? Because he was abused. He suffered. He forgave. And he died. And he rose again on the third day. You see, everything, that is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we have came into this church service today to celebrate and to remember. But what you may not think about is that even after the resurrection, Jesus still had scars. But Jesus didn't hide those scars, did he? In John chapter 20, we, I preached a sermon about this several weeks ago or maybe months ago. It's talking about the disciple Thomas. He wasn't with the other disciples when Jesus uh, basically appeared in a locked room. The disciples were scared to death. Thomas wasn't with them. So they go back to Thomas and said, hey, Jesus is alive. And we saw him firsthand. And what did Thomas say? He said, I will not believe it unless I see the scars on his hands. I can put my hand through his side. I will not believe it. And then we know that later on that Jesus met Thomas exactly where Thomas was and he witnessed it for himself, but he saw the scars. You see, Jesus allowed his scars to be the testimony of the healing that the resurrecting power of our Father, our Heavenly Father, of what he provides, that he brings dead things back to life. And so somebody today needs to hear this. This is how good our God is. This is what our God does. You see, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. Meaning that if you've accepted Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, what does that mean? You are a new man. Ladies, you are a new woman. I told the first service, this is the symbolic meaning of baptism. Why do we baptize? What does it represent? That a person, when they go into the water, it represents their old life. It represents all the mistakes. It represents all of their sin, all the pain that, that has been inflicted upon them, all the pain that they've inflicted on other people. When they go into the water, they're going into the baptism of Jesus. And when you raise them out of the water, they are new. They are a new creation. That all those things are behind us. All things have been dealt with. Those things have been healed. So I want to invite you today to receive the healing power 
of what Jesus has already provided for you and for me. I want to invite those of you who that you have scars and you've been hiding them. Your spouse may not know anything about them. No one else within your circle may know anything about your past. And you may say, but if I bring it up, then what's that going to do? What is that going to reveal? Listen, healing is found on the other side. In other words, you've got to take a, a bold step of faith. You got to step out of the darkness and bring that thing within the light because whatever is hidden and it's brought into the light, that is when healing can take place. Now, I want to close with this. If David, if you'll come on to the keyboard, I want to read to you two of the most important verses of Scripture that served as a prophecy of what Jesus was coming to do. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5, and many of you, you know this. You could quote this without me reading it. Surely he, who is the he in this scripture? He's talking about Jesus. Has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. We are healed. Church, we don't need another hero. We're not waiting on the Messiah to come. We're not waiting for the great physician to do his perfect work. It's done. When Jesus said it is finished, John 19, 30. It's what he's talking about. It's done. It's taken care of. It's it's dealt with. But yet there are some of you that you have been You've been burdened with whatever it is that you've been struggling. You've been trying to carry. You've been trying to do it within your own strength. And again, there are days that you are strong. There are days that you're riding the top of the way. But yet there are others that you find yourself in the valley, in the pit of life. And it feels like that everything is about to come on down upon you. Because there's a root. There is something that you've never just trusted with God. You may trust God with your marriage. You may trust God with your finances. You may trust God even with your children. And what we we did today in the child dedication, you may trust God with your children. You may trust Him in every area, but there is one thing that you keep holding on to. That somehow you have bought into the lie of the enemy that He says, oh, you better not share that. You better not bring that open. Listen, break through. Bring it to light. Bring it to light. And what I believe is that supernaturally is God's going to begin a healing work in this service, in this place, right now as I speak. See, I believe that God wants to restore what the devil has stolen. I believe he wants to give back everything and more. And yet, you know, sometimes we blame the devil for everything. And probably right so. It's probably the right thing to do. But listen, the devil, he, he wants to keep you under the control of whatever it is that you've gone through. And listen, there are some of you that that today that as I'm preaching, that this may not necessarily connect with you. This may may not be your story, but there's a person beside you to your right or to your left or somebody sitting behind you that this this is, this is their story. And so I want to do something here today. And this this is a little bit different. And I want to encourage you that that can, can can we give God about 10 minutes here? I mean, we came to church. Isn't this about letting God, be, let him have control here? Can we give him 10 minutes? And can I ask you today, can we be sensitive to the power of the Holy Spirit? Can we be reverent before God? Can we not be the distraction that may rob your neighbor of receiving a healing today? Can we just kind of stay put? You know, we're, we're a little bit early here, very intentional that we want to give God some time. We want to give people time to press in. So can, can you please do that with me? Let's not be moving around. Let's just be serious right now. Saints, would you pray with me? Church, will all of you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we pause in this moment, God, I'm fully relinquishing this service to you. Holy Spirit, I invite you to drive. God, I pray that you would start working within hearts even in this moment. God, that there are those that they are struggling because of something that has been bound to them due to their past. But God, I pray today that this is the day that they're going to let it out. They're going to to put it before you. They're going to lay it down, Jesus, at your feet. And they're going to exchange that heavy burden 
for yours because Jesus you said your burden is easy and light Jesus said you said put Jesus you invite us to put it on your back Jesus you invite us to give it to you Jesus, you invite us to put our pain. You invite us to put all the abuse. You invite us to put all of it. Because Jesus, you've already carried it. You've already dealt with it. So God, I pray that our faith is increased to know that, that we do serve under a high priest who you do sympathize according to our pains. You do sympathize to the hardships of what we have faced within life. But God, you care. And God, you've responded to that much suffering and even more but yet you continue to do it sinless you responded in a sinless way which was exactly what we had to have to be the perfect sacrifice for all of our sin so God today we do boldly come before you to the throne of grace and God I pray that you would pour out your mercy that God that you are going to do something because God there are people here today that they're in need their need is not not something that's going to come in the future their need is right now today God, because I believe that you're an on-time God. God, I believe that you care. God, I believe that you're here. God, I believe that your presence is here. God, I pray that you would do what only you can do. Church, would you stand with me across the house today? Ever since we, the church, went through the time of COVID, it seemed like that something became missing when it come to this moment within church service like that people resist you know the altars are open and it's like that everybody feels restrained they feel like that that there's no way that they can take that bold step of faith and come before God I don't know what happened with them I think that was the worst thing that happened from COVID and I'm declaring today we're going to break that we're going to break that old that that tradition that was set forth over the last four years we're going to break that today and I want to invite you today as, as they sing, these altars are going to open and we've got a prayer team that they're ready to come beside you and pray with you. And we are going to experience healing today. Now there are some of you who are saying, but Pastor Mark, it's not an abuse issue. That is okay. Listen, if the Holy Spirit is prompting you and moving you right now, He's wanting to do something else in you. So just because you come to the altars may not identify anything with that. It could just be the Holy Spirit's drawing you because you want more. You need more. You need a fill up. You need to connect in with the Holy Spirit and let your faith be increased here today. As they sing this morning, would you be obedient to what God's calling you to do? Would you come to these altars and let us pray with you that healing, the healing power of Jesus Christ will take place here in this altar on this day, on Sunday, April 14th, 2024. Would you come this morning?
grab the person to the side of you? Would you grab their hand? Can we just pray in this moment? Heavenly Father, Lord, I still believe you're doing a work within this congregation. I believe that you're doing a work at those who are watching right now live stream. God, I pray for those who, Lord, they may not have come to this altar, but God, they're making a commitment to trust you with something that they've never trusted you with before. Lord, whether it's a pain, Lord, whether it's grief, whether it's sickness, God, we just present it to you today. And God, as we exchange it, God, I pray that you would place an easy burden upon each of us. And God, that we would recognize that every bad thing that has happened, what the devil has intended for harm, God, I believe that you're going to use it for good. God, I believe that there's a testimony that is coming out of lives here today. Lord, that they're going to be able to say, yes, I have proof that I have scars of what I've gone through. But let me tell you about who healed me from the, the pain and the wound. Who healed the wound. Lord, let, let us not be ashamed of our scar. It's the proof of the battle that we've been in. And God, there are many here today they have been in a battle. But God, we celebrate today that we are victorious in you. So God, as we go our separate ways today, God, I pray that you will continue to work Lord, through each and every heart, each and every life. And Lord, for those who need to go a little bit further, Lord, if they need professional help, if they need some counseling, if they need some, some encouraging, some coaching, God, I pray, Lord, that <coughs> we will be able to provide that to them and for them. God, I thank you for what you've done today, for your glory, for your honor. Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen, amen. If you're here today and this message has resonated within you maybe something within you maybe you're in a place or a position that that you need help to go to the next level when uh, uh, in achieving the healing God wants for you here on the screen we have several different um, connections for you uh, some of these are local we have the Northeast Georgia Christian counseling group that is local we have cornerstone counseling which is local for those of you, maybe God has impressed upon you that you want to be part of the solution and help those and families who find themselves in domestic violence or children who are suffering from child abuse. I want to encourage you to contact the South Anoda Child Advocacy Center. And there's a contact here on the screen as well. Uh, but the biggest thing is that don't do this alone. We need each other. This is the purpose of the body of Christ, to walk through these difficult things and let's do it together. Again, we celebrate in the good times, but we also cry with each other during the hard times, during the grieving times, the hard times. This is what I believe what makes the Cleveland Worship Center so special because we all care for each other. We, we love each other. We've been there. We've done that so we can walk with each other and, and achieve healing that Jesus has provided. Um, in closing, I, just, I, I want to just highlight and celebrate something very, very special. It's an honor to have... Uh, a, a, a new person with us, Dusty and Kim, they have uh, worked for years uh, in the attempt to adopt uh, a young man, and it is officially, he's here today, and so we praise the Lord that Kofi is here in kids ministry, and so I just praise God with you, and uh, we're, we're with you, we're going to walk with you guys as well in this process so we give God all the glory and honor thank you for being here today we love each and every one of you have a wonderful afternoon